Those of you who have been coming to Bible study recently, you know what we've been talking about, right? We have been talking about, we're in the book of James, studying, actually right now we're in chapter 3, and what are we talking about there? The tongue. We're talking about the tongue, what you say. So it's important that, you know, we've, we've kind of, the tongue there signifies the words we say, the words we speak, right? That's what the tongue represents, because really, if you cut off the tongue, uh, you might not be able to make a whole bunch of sounds in your mouth. I mean, speech sounds. That's just how it is. I was thinking about it, all the crazy sounds we make and all that. If you take the tongue out, there's only a few that you may be able to make. I don't even know if you can make any of those sounds at all. So the tongue is that powerful in our body, and we were, you know, we had some interesting stats this last few weeks. Uh, how, many, how many words did they say? Uh, I mean, again, I, don't, I can't confirm this research, but there's this thing out there that women, you know, guys speak about how many words a day? Somebody remember? 7, about 7,000 words a day. Okay? And ladies speak half as much as that, right? Yeah. About 3,500. Mm -hmm. Right? How many words do ladies speak, Patrick? 15,000? 15, 15, Come on! <laughs> he just doubled that. Okay, 15,000. But what we studied, you know, is that ladies speak about how many? Three times seven. Three times seven. <laughs> okay, not good. About 20,000 or 21,000 words a day. With this la 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 in our mouth, this tongue we got, right? We speak a lot of words in one solitary day. Okay? So, you're welcome, sister. And the tongue is very small. It says all these words. And we say that there are people today in our world who are suffering. There are adults today who are suffering because of things they heard when they were kids. People who are significant in their lives say things to them, and they're carrying their baggage throughout their adult life. Trying to not live up to that or not knowing how to not live up to those things they call the self-fulfilling prophecies. And you find children today, adults, actually living according to the things that significant people said to them. The teacher said that to them. Maybe their mom and their dad said that, that you will never amount to anything, blah, blah, blah. And the child is carrying all that all through their lives. We said that the tongue has a great potential for good. Think about that. Think about a ship that's only turned around by a rudder. I mean, seriously, the one thing that can move a ship is the wind. But the pilot can turn this big old ship to whatever direction that he wants to just by moving the rudder. Or think about a horse. As heavy as it is, tons, you can just move the horse or direct it the way you want it to go by putting the bit in its mouth. Little things have great consequences. And the tongue has this great potential to do good. And at the same time, think about California right now. The fire is all over the place. It started by just one little spark somewhere. A little spark. Maybe someone smoked a cigarette and didn't, you know, just uh, quench the thing. Or maybe some crazy person just lit a match or a little of something, a little fire. And the tongue is compared to all of that. Great consequences, positive and negative. The tongue. Potential for good for, to those who are hearing you and potential for a lot of good to you, the speaker. The same way has a great potential, have a, has a great, a great, shall I say, deadly consequence for the person using it and the person listening to it. It can start devastating fires, the tongue. And I, I don't know, I think I 
probably posted that this week. I'm asking, before you say that word today, before you say that word to your friend, to your, to your spouse, to your son, your child, before you say that word to them, think, is your word going to encourage? Is the word going to build up? Or is it going to tear down? Is it going to make them cheerful? Or is it going to make them sad? After people have talked to you and talked to me, how do they feel going back? Do they feel better after we've talked to them or do they feel worse because of what we said to them? The tongue. Think about what you're saying. And we looked at this passage here. I'm basically downloading the Bible study this Friday, to, you know, this last Wednesday. To you. We looked at a passage in Proverbs 18.21. If you have your smartphones or your Bible, turn to that. It's, it's going to be on the screen as well. Proverbs 18, verse 21. It says this, and I refer to this last. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Wow. Death and life? You mean the stuff I say can give or nurture life? The stuff I say can, on the other hand, bring about death, destroy life, or make life not worth living for people? The Bible says, for such a thing that is so powerful, though very tiny, very small, but so powerful, we need to be careful how we use it, either in reference to ourselves or in reference to other people. Words do matter. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? No way. That's not true. Words know how to hurt us deeply. Words kill people installmentally. Sticks and stones may kill them right away, and they're out. We basically put them out of the misery, so to say. But words keep them in misery for the rest of their lives. They can be walking dead. The walking dead because of the words that significant people spoke to them. Your husband may not be happy because of what you said to him. Your wife may be so sad, so unhappy, and unable to accomplish her purpose in life. Unable to accomplish her potential in life because of what you said to them. Or perhaps because of what their parents said to them. So be careful what you say. Interesting though, words don't come out of thin air, right? They don't. They come from somewhere. Our words are nurtured in our hearts and nurtured in our minds. They come from the beliefs that we hold. And by the way, not everything that gets into your mind should come out. Some uh, very clever sister said that on, on Wednesday. Here is a spiritual rule about using the tongue. The spiritual rule for victory is this. You have feelings, you have your fears and displeasure and frustrations and all of that. Don't speak based on those. Speak according to the word of God. Don't speak according to whatever else you see in society. Don't speak according to how you feel. Don't speak according to what you see, what you hear. Speak the truth that is consistent with the word of God. The truth. That's what matters. Because sometimes we believe the wrong thing and we say the wrong thing. And those things we say have consequences on us. So we got to think about the consequences of our, our speech before we make them. Think. This thing that I'm about to say, how is that going to impact the other person? And how is that going to impact me? Because the words that I say reflect who I am. They reflect how I feel. They reflect how I think. So let's be careful. Because words matter. Words matter. And don't think that if people didn't hear what you said, <laughs> the mind doesn't forget. This is a problem. This brain we have, oh boy, it's a big storage. It stores all kinds of information, and it does not lose any of them. All it takes is for the right moment to come up, and that person recalls, oh boy, so-and-so person said that to me 30 years ago. 
So and so person said that to me five years ago. I remember what my mom said to me when I was three years old. I remember what my dad said to me when I was five years old. The, the brain doesn't lose anything. Wouldn't we rather speak good things to the brain? Wouldn't we rather say things that will build up people? Say the truth to them. If you have nothing good to say, don't say it. Well, by the way, if you look around, if you really listen carefully, if you look around, you're going to see something good to say about anyone. <clears throat> Fortunately for us, we have the ability to change the, those beliefs. We have the ability to change the beliefs. We can change the beliefs. And as the saying goes, you change your life by changing your thoughts. And by implication, you can change your life by changing what you say changing your words. And I want to challenge you today. Some of you, some of you are living today according to what you heard several years ago, according to how somebody treated you eons ago, if you're that old. I want you to begin to counteract those things that you heard. Counter the things that you heard. Counter the things that people have said about you when you weren't a child of God. Counter them today by looking at the word of God, by saying, I am a child of God. I have been set free by Jesus Christ. I have eternal life. My future is bright because I know who holds tomorrow. Jesus Christ holds tomorrow, and because of that, I shall live. That's what he said. Because I live, you too shall live. And God, Jesus Christ, has come to give me life and life more abundantly. So it doesn't matter what anyone said about me before. I have life and I have it more abundantly because God, who does not change, God, whose word does not change, God, who never goes back on his word, says, I have given you life and not death. I will live and not die. And I will proclaim the mercies of God. So we can change our beliefs. And how do we change our beliefs? Go to the word. Go to the word. Well, that's the Bible study from Wednesday. If you weren't here on Wednesday, you just got it. Careful what you say. But in the passage that we've been looking at, we're going to see how this all ties up. The people of God have said, you know what, nah, we are not able. God says, you are able to go and take the land that I'm giving you. And they said, we are not able to take the land that God has said we are able to take. We're not able to do that. Ten of the spies gave them an evil report. Only two stood by the truth based on the word of God. And the majority of the people went ahead and believed what the 10 said. That's democratic enough. But they didn't believe what the minority said, the minority report. And when Moses heard that, he fell to the ground, basically, and prayed. And begged them, please do not rebel against the Lord. Don't do that. Do not rebel against the Lord. Do not rebel against the plans and the purpose of God. Do not rebel against God's, you know, uh, leadership. Because they said, you know what, let's find someone else. Down with these people who are telling you all this junk. Let's find some people to take us back to Egypt. Let's go back over there. Otherwise, we're going to die. In matter of fact, it's better for us that we die in this desert. That's what they said. And Moses begged them, please don't do that. But here's the problem. Moses is going to now turn from the people. After begging them, he's going to turn from them and go to the Lord in prayer and say, God, please don't. Because God says, Look, let me just destroy them and I'll raise up a new Family for Abraham through you, Moses. But Moses says no. He shifts his attention to the Lord to plead with God. He and Aaron, his brother, pleaded with God. But here's a problem. They will succeed partially. They will still secure the promise for Abraham because God's promises will never change. 
He says, I'm going to give this land to Abraham and his descendants. So Moses is going to secure that. But for those who said, we are not able, we don't want to do it, we, well, that's a different story altogether. The dissidents, those who disagreed with God, are going to perish according to their own choice. According to their choice. That's why the subtitle of this message is self-determination by your tongue. It's self-determination by your own tongue. What you say is what you get. Because what you say is what you believe. And you're going to act on what you believe. And that's why I want you to believe right. Believe right. Let your beliefs accord with the word of God so that you can be a successful person. I mean, who better to work with than God who is able? But Moses went to the Lord. I believe chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. If you have your Bible, you can go there. Numbers chapter 14, from verse 13, here's what it says. <clears throat> but Moses, I'm going to read some of it. Some of it will be on the screen, but I'm going to read that. But Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For you brought up these people in your might from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of the land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud, your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land that he swore to give to them, and he has killed them in the wilderness. That's the first appeal there. God, what you're saying you're going to do? Uh-uh. Remember, God, you and I are in this together. Your purpose is my purpose. You appointed me to lead these people from Egypt into the promised land. I've bought into your purpose already. And this is not what we agreed to in the, at first. We agreed that you were going to take these people into the promised land. I remember all the miracles that you did through me to deliver these people from Egypt. It's not a good thing if you destroy them here. I know they've sinned against you, but it's not good for you to destroy them here because that's going to affect your reputation. The people who don't know you, the people who didn't see what happened, how these, these guys, uh, the, the Israelites have offended you, those people are going to say, uh-huh, we knew it. This God was, is not able to fulfill his promise to the people. Therefore, Lord, don't do it. You probably think you don't have any influence in God's kingdom as a child of God. You do have some influence, a lot of it too. Because God is counting on you. God is counting on you to intervene when he's about to destroy. God is counting on you when some calamity is falling upon your family or whatever. God is counting on you. He says, and I sought for a man. I saw that these guys were so bad, they're so wicked, and I wanted to destroy them. But I sought for a man, one man. Who will come in the middle between me and the people? Who will come and plead with me? I'm paraphrasing. Who, who will come and plead with me so that I don't destroy them? I sought for one man, one woman, one person that will stand between God and the pe people so that I don't destroy them. You know the other tragedies? God says, I found none. It's not that the people sinned, that, that's bad enough. That's not the issue. But the issue is that after they have sinned and I wanted to destroy them, I sought for one person who would say, Lord, please have mercy. Don't destroy them. And I saw none. I found none among them. If God wants to destroy today, if he wants to destroy today, will he find us as faithful people who will stand and say, God, please, please, this is not consistent with your mercy. Please forgive 
Please do not kill. Please do not destroy. That's our job. And God says, when you do that, I will respond. So did Moses cause the Lord to change his mind? No. This is consistent with the personality of God. When I want to do something that's really going to hurt people, I just need one man to rise up and say, Lord, please don't do that. And on the basis of that, I will relent. So Moses has just done that. If you kill these people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring his people into the land that he swore to give them that he has killed them in the wilderness. And now please, let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will not, you will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and their children to the third and the fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of these people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven these people from Egypt until now. Okay, two strategies. One, he appealed to God's reputation. God, this is how the world knows you. The world knows you as a powerful God. You do what you say you do. Therefore, don't do anything that will be contrary to that. I know you have a right to be angry. I know you have a right to punish these people, but please don't do that. You promised to take them into the promised land. Don't destroy them now. That's one. So when you pray, what should you do? I want you to let your knowledge of the integrity of God be the foundation of your faith. Do you know God? Do you know the integrity of God? That God, when he has made a promise, will not go back on that, that he's a faithful God? Let that be the foundation of your faith. And when you pray, I want you to remember. Remember, that, remember God's reputation. And by the way, remind him. Not that he doesn't know. Remind him of his reputation. God, this is what you said. This is what your word says. And you say you never go back on your word. It says, God is not man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of a man that he should change his mind. Has he promised and will he not fulfill it? Remind him that. Remind him. If there's any promise the Lord has made to you, present that to the Lord. Speak that promise to him. He wants to hear that. Because he wants to know that you believe him. He wants to know that you take him seriously. When you pray, don't go saying whatever comes into your mind. Go to the word of God. What does the Bible, what does the word say about my circumstance? I'm going to repeat, back, repeat that back to God. So repeat that to God. His reputation that he is both powerful and faithful to fulfill his promises. And then secondly, Moses now appealed to God's own self-revelation. Remember when Moses had a problem? <laughs> Moses had a problem at one point when the children of Israel had sinned against him. And they said, ah, we, we don't want to do that. They disobeyed God. They made a golden calf and everything and disobeyed God. And God says, okay, I'm just going to let you guys go ahead. Just go, go into this promise, promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. I will not go with you. Because if I go with you, I'm going to destroy you all on the way. You are not, you are stiff-necked, very disobedient people. Therefore, you know what? I don't want to go. I'll send an angel with you. But I don't want to go with you because I've revealed myself to you this many times. And you are still disobedient. You're still not trusting me. Therefore, go. I, I don't want to go with you. Moses again did what? He says, no, Lord. Let's not do that. And he asked the Lord to reveal his glory to him. He said, God, I want you to reveal your glory to me. Reveal, tell me who you are. Tell me. I want to understand you. I want to know who you are. And God said, okay, I'm going to take you to the mountain. Go to Mount Sinai. Up there, I will reveal myself to you. I will show you who I am. And when the Lord appeared to Moses, what did he say? Well, I am the Lord. The Lord, slow to anger. 
abounding in mercy and steadfast love. That's exactly how the Lord revealed himself to Moses. And guess what Moses has just done in this prayer? Okay, Lord, I hear what you're saying, but the last time we spoke, you told me that you are slow to anger, abounding in love and mercy. Therefore, do as you said. Act according to your personality, according to your character. It's time for you to do, to live up to what you told the people about yourself. It's okay. You're not being arrogant when you tell God. You're a merciful God. If you do this, it's going to be interpreted as wickedness. Don't do that, Lord. Please show mercy. It's perfectly okay. God wants his people to intervene. Moses Use these two things. So when you pray, I want you to remind God of his revealed character. Let your knowledge of his character reassure you. You've got to do that. When you pray for the sick, don't just talking about whatever. No, 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 no. You go back to the word and say, what did the Bible say about the sick? What does the Bible say about that? Oh, I read somewhere where it says, that Jesus Christ himself has carried away all our infirmities and our diseases. And I read another place where he says, oh, he forgives all my sins and does what? Heals all my diseases. That's what you said, Lord. I see it right here. And I believe in you. I trust in you. That's your word. You know, when you say that, you are not causing God to change his mind. You're only reassuring yourself that your faith is written down somewhere. That the basis of your faith is written down, and therefore you can stand on it. Because God does not change his mind on his promises. I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I am the Lord. I you got to say that to him. I am the Lord. He says, I change not. I don't change. Therefore, you are not consumed because, man, if I change, if I change as you all change, you can't trust me. You will know what's coming next. When you run into a problem, you will know what to do because I don't know, man. The last time I went to him, he didn't do nothing. Therefore, I'm not sure he's going to do squat right now. But God is faithful. He's faithful. He, he has elevated his word above everything else. And he wants you to count on him. Well, here's the bad news. When you fail to believe God and you believe your own thing, when you, when you make a choice, God will honor your choice as well. Which is where we're going here. Because God has given us the freedom to choose. He's given us the freedom to choose. We, we, we can choose what we want. And he will not violate that right. He will not violate that power that we have to choose. He will not violate our choice. He has revealed his truth to us. He's revealed his purpose to us. He has told us what he will do. He has told us that Jesus Christ is it. You know, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. Well, if you don't want to believe that, you're saying, yeah, I think he was kind of lying. I'm not ready to believe that. Well, if you don't believe what Jesus says, and what God says about Jesus, you on your own. Because Jesus did not leave any, he didn't leave any um, options for anything else. He didn't say I'm one of the ways. He didn't say I am a, a way. He says I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want life, you got it from me. If you want to go to the Father, you got to come through me. If you want to know the truth, that's me because I am the truth. So you can definitely choose not to believe that. But he's saying, as far as I'm concerned, you are on your own. Don't call me when, no, 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 he doesn't say that. Don't call me when trouble comes. No, you can call me anytime. As long as you're alive, there's chance. I'll still respond to you. I'm waiting for you. I don't want it to take you too long. 
Because we don't have all the time in the world? So God reveals himself. He reveals his word, his purpose to us. He has revealed to us that the only way to get to heaven is the way of the cross. He has revealed the right way, the way of righteousness to us. He has revealed that. And he said you can only find salvation in the name of Christ. Salvation is found in no other name. For there is no other name on earth given among men by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. That, these are some really tough statements. It's like... If you don't believe this, you better come up with something better. Unfortunately, though, though God has revealed himself to us, God, though God has said, if you come to me, I'll give you life. Though God has said, I present to you, I place before you today life and death. I place that before you. Every one of us today has this thing that God has revealed to us. There's life and there's death. And God says, I want you to choose life so that things will go well for you. Even though God has done all of this, has presented all these things to us, unfortunately, there are still people who will go to the hellfire. Yeah, it's not a very popular topic these days. But there are some people who will still go to hellfire because they chose not to believe the Son of God. God presents to us his promises, his plans, and he assures us of his power and faithfulness to fulfill them. I mean, I'm talking about those of us who already believe in Christ. He gives us his promises in the word, and he has shown us that he is powerful and that he is faithful, that he will do what he says he will do. And he says to us, the only way you can access anything that I give you Everything that I've given you by grace, the only way you can access them is by faith, period. Faith is non-meritorious. That is to say, it's not based on any human merit. It's not based on anything that I have done. It's not based on me being good. Faith is saying, hey, I accept everything you've done for me, Lord. Uh, when you come to me, he says, I don't want you to have a plan B. We don't want to hear that. Americans, we don't want to hear about no plan B. I got to have a plan B. I want to be sure all my bases are covered. So I, I'm going to, yeah, I'll go to church on Sunday. But uh, I'm just going to put this food over there just in case. Just in case this doesn't work, I can always go back to this one. <laughs> God says, I don't like that. And trust me, I know when you're doing that. No plan B for you. All in with me. I want you to be all in with me so that if I fail you, you are doomed. But the good news is I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. No matter what the problem is in your life, I will never forsake you. But you know one thing? There are still some believers today who will choose to live a defeated, spiritually unproductive life because they don't want to have faith in God. Because of their lack of faith, they're going to be spiritually defeated, depressed, unproductive. When situations come upon them, they don't know how to pray or how to believe God for victory. They choose to strive on their own rather than put all their faith in God, rather than let God be in control of the situation. Some believers are going to choose fear. And some of you here, you choose fear and misery rather than confidence in God. Yeah, there are people that do that. You choose to focus on your circumstances rather than focusing on God. And having a restful mind. Yeah. God, I put this in your hands. You never failed me before, and you're not going to fail now. So I'm going to just trust you. I'll trust you. And not be afraid. And have the peace of God which passes all understanding. But people make choices. And here's what I want to tell you. Life's choices are not, they, they are a package deal. 
like a restaurant menu. That's how choices are. Life is not a buffet. The choices we make is not like the choice you make in a buffet. It's not a place where you can choose whatever you want. Okay, I don't like that. I want a little of that, a little of that, a little of that. Eh. In some ways, life is not like that. You don't get all these things just for one price or whatever. Life is more, more like a restaurant menu. Here's what happens. When you choose this one here, here's a side that goes with it. Here's what goes with that. Boom, boom, boom. Basically, the behavior and the consequence go together. You can't choose the behavior and refuse the consequence that goes with that. That doesn't work. I know we are Americans. We like freedom. We like uh, all that stuff, but it doesn't work. When you choose a behavior, you also choose the consequence that goes with it. Spiritually speaking as well. The, what are the consequences of failing to invest in your relationship? Well, you might be alone sometimes. It's a lack of trust. It's a loss of influence if you fail to invest in your relationship. If you destroy what you have, be ready to go without. If you want to drive without insurance, well, be ready to pay out of pocket if you ever get in a wreck. Once you choose a behavior, guess what? You also choose the natural consequence that comes with it. And where am I going with this? And by the way, God reveals those consequences to us ahead of time. But we got to choose. If you don't come through Christ, you're choosing hell. If you don't come by the way of faith, you're choosing not, not, not for me not to listen to you. There's no place for human merit. There's none. Those of us who have come to know Jesus Christ, who have come to believe in Jesus Christ, we know that, that we are not what we are because we're good. We know that it's because of the mercy of God. We know that because... You know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every human being in the world has sinned. Even the one that's born today, God says, you've sinned too. Why? You got it from mama and papa. Where did they get it? They got it from Adam and Eve. It's in us. We're sinners. We don't please God just as we are. If you, if, you, if you want me to accept you, you've got to come to me and accept the grace that I've given to you by allowing Jesus Christ, my son, that's myself, to die for you. All, all have sinned, including the cutest, amazing baby. It says all have sinned and have come short. We don't hit the mark of God's righteousness and glory. And the wages of sin is death, eternal death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We are justified by grace through faith. Well, it's all unmerited. We don't deserve it. Then the Lord said, I have put on them. Moses, I heard you. I've put on the people according to your word. Isn't that powerful? When God says, I did it because you asked for it. Man, I like that. I really like it. When the Lord says, I did it just because you prayed. I changed my mind, you know, quote unquote, just because you asked me. You are that powerful with God. You have that much leverage with God. I did it just because you said. I did it because you prayed. If you hadn't prayed, I wouldn't have done it. Doesn't I tell you that your prayer is powerful? I don't care what kind of crisis is going on in your family. It doesn't matter what it is that's happening in your life. There isn't anything we cannot get from God through prayer. There is no such thing. Because God wants us to pray. He says, I want you to pray. I know what I can do. I am able, I'm mighty, I am faithful, but I still want you to pray. There's stuff you're not going to get unless you pray. Mark that. 
There is stuff in your life that you will never be able to change unless you pray. And when you pray, you got to pray like there's no other thing to do. This is the only thing that I've got. It's not a last resort. Lord, this is it. If I come to you, anything I cannot get from you, I cannot get it from any other person in life. I'm going to pray. I'm going to sacrifice time. Rather than watch the stupid TV, television or, uh, program or do whatever else, I'm going to kneel down in, my, in the quietness of my room and pray and call upon heaven and draw strength from heaven. I'm going to do that. So he says, I, I, I heard you. But truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that, that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to the fathers, and none of those who despise me shall see it. Wow. All those people who saw my glory in Egypt, who saw when I parted the Red Sea, who saw when I, I, I provided water for them, I turned bitter water into good water, sweet water, and I got water out of the rock for them, who saw me when I gave them manna? Who saw me when I gave them meat out of nothing? All those people who saw it but still rebelled against me, none of them will get into this land. Why? Because they said, we are not going. We are not able. We can't do it. The people over there are stronger than we are. They forgot their God. And God says, everyone who has rebelled against me consciously, will not be a part of the blessing that I promised. Wow. You mean you can vote yourself out? Yes, you can. <laughs> I'm telling you, all of you, believe in the word of God and be ready to act on it. Believe in God because he is your life. Trust in him if he, even if it doesn't look like it makes sense. Even if it looks like it doesn't make sense. In fact, faith will make you look stupid. Faith will make you look like you're out of your mind. When you see an impossible circumstance and you say, in the name of Jesus, it shall change. When you see a dying person, you say, I speak life into you. When you see a circumstance that, does, that has no hope, you say, there is hope. When you see that and you talk that way, you look crazy. You look stupid, but you're saying it because you believe in the word of God more than you believe anything else. Boy, faith has got to make you look stupid. I tell you that. <laughs> but you know what? You are not crazy. Because you're speaking the truth of the word of God. Well, they chose not to go. And God honored their choice. Remember, just because they are children of Abraham doesn't mean everything is a God. No. Even one family from Abraham is enough. Not every member of uh, the Jewish nation will inherit the promise. Even one person, one person, is enough. And by the way, can I say this? Christianity is not, it's not a democracy, sorry. Christianity is not a democracy. It's not a rule of the majority. Just because the majority voted for something doesn't make it right. It is a rule of the word. It's a rule by the word of God. Even one person that stands with God is greater than the majority that's despising God. The point is for us to stand with the truth. So just because we have Abraham as father doesn't mean everything is cool. Doesn't mean everyone is inheriting the, 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 the blessing. Each one, each person has a chance to believe in and pursue the promise made to Abraham. 
Each one has to prove his own faith. You all, each of you here, you have to prove your own faith. You can't go by the faith of someone else. You have to prove your own faith. You have to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Each one has the opportunity to agree with God to, in order to, to, to inherit the promise. And those who choose to believe God, disbelieve God, even fight against God, well, God says, I have nothing for you. They said they weren't able to do it, and God said, I heard you. You're not able. Even though I'm here with you, I'm going to fight for you. You say you're not able, you're not willing, you don't want to do it. I heard you. Let it be done unto you according to your faith. Because the rebels have seen the glory of God, and yet they did not believe God. So, I don't know what you're going to do today because for these guys, it ended up with them spending more time in the wilderness. But those who were, who agreed with God, God says, I'll reward them. They agreed with me. They believed me. They did not spread this bad news to the people. They spoke encouragement. They spoke life. They agreed with my purpose and my word. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Ooh, be careful what you say. What you have said to my hearing, I will do to you. They said they wanted to die in the desert. Well, God says, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness and all of your number. Listed in the census from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one of them, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell. Wow. Just because they said, count me out, God says, I heard you and I counted you out. You say you want to die, okay, you're going to die. Whatever you said is what you're going to get. All those people that heard it, that saw me, saw my greatness, but chose to go against me, none of them will get in there except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Those were the only two that said, we are able to take this land. Let's go at once and get it. And the people say, stone them. God says, those two, they're going to be the only ones who are older than 20 years that will get into the land. But all of those who are 20 and above, who rebel again, none of them will get into the land. Wow, that's going to be quite a few people. I'm not just going to slaughter them like that. They're going to be wandering around for 40 years, a journey that should have taken a very short time by faith. God says, I'm going to let you all wander around the desert for 40 years, by which time most of those, all those guys will have died. Why don't you just agree with God? Why don't you just believe God? But your little ones whom you said would become a prey, I will bring in and they shall know the land that you have rejected. Bible is clear. They rejected the land. When they disagreed with God, they rejected the land. They rejected God's purpose for their lives. And God says, I got you. You want it? That's what you get. God is fair. It's going to give the younger generation a chance. It's going to give them a chance today. It's giving us a chance today. Your parents may not have done it right. Others in your life may not have done it right. But God is giving us a chance today to believe him. He's not going to punish the, the innocent and the guilty. No. He gives them a chance. I'll give you a chance to believe. I'll give you a chance to do it right. I'll give you a chance to trust me. I'll give you a chance to have faith in me. I'll give you a chance to pray. I'll give you a chance to hear the word of God and receive the abundant life that Jesus Christ alone can give. I'll give you a chance to do that. And see if you will accept it or reject. Because whichever way you go, it's fine with me. That's not my intention. My goal is not for anyone to perish. I do want everyone to come to repentance, but I can't force people. My goal is not to deprive people of what is theirs, 
But I want everyone to have faith in me that no matter what's happening, that they can trust me and know that I will show up when they need me. I, I need that. I need people to trust me, the Lord is saying. I need you to trust me. I need you to trust me before you can see the solution. I need you to trust me that I know what I'm doing, even if you, you are confused. I want you to still trust me. It doesn't make any sense. Yes, it's true. I know. But I, it makes all the sense, you know, all the sense if you follow my logic. If you follow my logic that I am with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you follow my logic that I'm with you, even, even though you don't see me, if you follow that, you will know. You will trust me. You will believe me no matter what's going on. You believe me for peace in your home no matter what's happening. You believe me for restoration of your family no matter what's happening. But you've got to believe me. If, if you're not ready to believe me, I don't have any hope for you. I have no hope for you. Because you've got to believe me ahead of time before you see the solution. That's how I operate, God says. That's how I roll. If you want to see the solution before you believe, anybody can do that. I want you to take the risk. Take the step before you know whether the water is deep or not. Take the step and know that I got you. I told you to put your foot in there. Whether it's deep or whether it is shallow, guess what? I got you. Trust me. If you trust me, you will do what, exactly what I tell you to do. So, and I've shown you in many ways that I am faithful. I've shown you. That's why I sent Jesus Christ to die for you. He came. That's my most valuable. That's me. I came down. I made myself to be like a, a despised human being, to become a despised human being just for you. I love you that much. I care about you. I gave up every, I gave up my reputation. I gave up my glory to come down into this world where people spat on me. They said crazy things about me. Even though I created the world, I came into the world that I created and they treated me as a foreigner. And I did it all for you. And this is a symbol of what I did for you. That. I did it for you. And I'm reminding you today that I did that for you. I allowed my body to be broken for you. I allowed my blood to be spilled for you. I did it all for you. For your sake. To bring you into my family. So I can give you life that is beyond life. That's what I did for you. What else do you want me to do? What more can I do to convince you that I love you? What more can I do to convince you that you are valuable to me? What more can I do? I've given you my life. I've given you my flesh. I've given everything. I've given my reputation. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, I did it all for you. Are you still going to doubt me? Or are you going to trust me? <laughs>